In the remainder of this lecture, we'll look at support vector machines. In lecture 5, we introduced the logistic regression model with the logarithmic loss, and we saw that it performed very well, but that it had one problem. When the data are very well separable, it didn't have any basis to choose between the two models like this. And yet, these are very different models. Here is an extreme example of the problem. We have two linearly separable classes, we have two linearly separable classes, and a decision boundary that separates the data perfectly. And yet, if I see a new instance that is very similar to the rightmost red point, but with a slightly higher x1 value, it is suddenly classified as a blue point. This illustrates the intuition behind the support vector machine loss function. If we generate new points near our existing points, they should be classified the same as the existing points. One way to accomplish this is to look at the distance from the decision boundary to the nearest red and blue points, and to maximize that. In this case, what we're looking for is the hyperplane that has a maximal distance to the nearest positive and the nearest negative point. For the blue class, there is only one point nearest the decision boundary, but for the red class, there are two points that are the same distance away. The value m is called the margin, and this is the quantity that we want to maximize in choosing our hyperplane. The result is what we call the maximum margin hyperplane. The points closest to the decision boundary are called the support vectors. This name comes from the fact that the support vectors alone are enough to describe the model. If I give you the support vectors, you can work out the hyperplane without seeing the rest of the data. As I said, the distance from the decision boundary to the support vector is called the margin, and we'll assume that the decision boundary is chosen so that the margin is the same on both sides. So now the question is, given a data set, how do we work out which hyperplane maximizes the margin? This is a tricky problem because the support vectors aren't fixed. If we move the hyperplane around to maximize the distance to one set of support vectors, we may move closer to other points, making them the support vectors. Surprisingly, there is a way to phrase the maximum margin hyperplane objective as a relatively simple optimization problem. To work this out, let's first review how we use a hyperplane to define a linear decision boundary. Here is the one-dimensional case. We have a single feature, and we first define a linear function from the feature space to a scalar y. If the function is positive, we assign the positive class, and if it is negative, we assign the negative class. Where this function is equal to zero is where it intersects the feature space and that is the decision boundary, which in this case is just a point. Now note that by defining the decision boundary in this way, we have actually given ourselves an extra degree of freedom. The same decision boundary can be defined by infinitely many hyperplanes, and we'll use this extra degree to help us define a single hyperplane to optimize. The decision boundary here is the dotted line where the hyperplane intersects the x1, x2 plane, and if we rotate the hyperplane about that dotted line, we get another hyperplane defining the same decision boundary. And the first thing we'll do in defining our support vector machine is choose one specific hyperplane from among that set. The hyperplane we will try to choose is the one that produces one for the positive support vectors and minus one for the negative support vectors. This means that for all other negative points, this hyperplane should produce values below minus one. And for all other positive points, this hyperplane should produce values above one. This is the picture that we want to end up with in two dimensions. The linear function evaluates to zero on the decision boundary, and it evaluates to minus one on this dotted line where it hits the negative support vectors. It evaluates to one on this dotted line where it hits the positive support vectors. The trick we will use to achieve this is to optimize with a constraint. We first define the margin as the distance from the decision boundary where the hyperplane evaluates to zero to the line where the hyperplane evaluates to one and on the other side to the line where the hyperplane evaluates to minus one. With that, our objective looks like this. The quantity that we want to maximize is twice this margin, the width of this band that separates the negative from the positive support vectors, and the constraint defines the support vectors. All positive points should evaluate to one or higher, 
and all negative points should evaluate to minus one or lower. Note that if we have n instances in our data, this gives us an objective with n constraints, one for each instance in our data. Note also that even though we've not specified that any of the points should actually have the values minus one and one, we will nevertheless end up with support vectors that evaluate to one and minus one. Why is that? Here's a picture of a case where all negative points are strictly less than minus one and all positive points are strictly larger than one. So the constraints are satisfied, but there are no support vectors. There are no points on the edges of the margin. In this case, we can easily make the margin bigger by pushing it out to touch the instances, giving us support vectors. Therefore, any hyperplane with a maximal margin that satisfies the constraints must have points on the edges of its margin. Otherwise, we could make the margin bigger. And these points are the support vectors. So to summarize, we want to maximize the distance between the point where the hyperplane hits minus one and where it hits one, while keeping the positive points above one and the negative points below minus one. With that in hand, the first thing we'll do is to simplify the two constraints into a single constraint. And we can do this very easily by introducing a label y1, which is minus one for negative points and plus one for positive points. If we do that and multiply it by the output of our linear function, then for positive points, the output stays the same and for negative points, the output gets a minus in front of it. This means that in both cases, the left-hand side should now be larger than or equal to one, which means we can summarize our two constraints into a single constraint. The next thing we need to do is take this phrase two times the size of the margin and work out how to express that more precisely. To do that, we'll first review what we learned earlier about the meaning of the parameters of our hyperplane. In the equation w t x plus b, w is the vector pointing orthogonally to the decision boundary. So with that, we can ask ourselves, in this picture, what is the size 2m? This is the value that we're interested in maximizing, twice the size of the margin. To make things easier, we can move the axis around so that the lower dotted line crosses the origin. Doing this doesn't change the size of the margin. We can now imagine a vector from the origin to the upper dotted line at a right angle, and we'll call this vector a. The length of this vector is exactly the quantity that we're interested in. Remember also that the vector w points in the same direction as a, orthogonal to the decision boundary. That gives us these two facts. At the origin, our hyperplane evaluates to minus one, and for vector a, our hyperplane evaluates to one. If we subtract the first equation from the second, the b's cancel out, and we get this expression. The dot product of w and a is equal to two. Now we know that w and a point in the same direction, so the angle between them is zero. If we look at this trigonometric definition of the dot product, we see that this cosine of alpha simplifies to one. So we can conclude that the magnitude of w times the magnitude of a is equal to two. Rewriting, we see that the magnitude of a which is the value that we were interested in, is equal to two over the magnitude of w. So the conclusion, the value that we're interested in maximizing, two times the size of the margin, is equal to two divided by the magnitude of w. So we can fill that in and get a complete optimization objective. Note that almost all the complexity of this loss function is in the constraints. Without them, we could just let all elements of w go to zero. However, the constraints require the output of our model to be larger than one for all positive points and smaller than minus one for all negative points. And this will automatically push the margin up to the support vectors, but no further. Since we tend to work with loss functions, things we like to minimize, we can take the inverse of our objective function and minimize that instead of maximizing. The result is called the hard margin support vector machine. It's called hard because no points are allowed to violate the constraint and end up inside the margin. This is a nice start, but it doesn't work well in two cases. First, when we have data that is not linearly separable. And second, when we could have a very nice decision boundary, 
if only we ignored a few misclassified points, for instance, when there is a little noise or a few outliers. To deal with those problems, we introduce a soft margin. Here, we allow a few points to be on the wrong side of the margin if it helps us achieve a better fit on the rest of the points. That is, we can trade off a few violations of the constraints against a bigger margin. The soft margin SVM looks like this. Here, we've introduced a slack parameter PI for each point XI, which indicates the extent to which the constraint on XI is relaxed. PI is a parameter, and our learning algorithm can set PI to whatever it likes. If it sets PI to zero, the constraint is the same as it was for the hard margin classifier. And if it sets PI higher than zero, the constraint is relaxed, and the point XI gets to fall inside the margin. However, the price we pay is that PI is added to our minimization objective. Our search algorithm, which we will detail later, does the rest. It automatically makes the trade-off between how much we want to violate the original constraints and how big we want the margin to be. C, here, is a hyperparameter, indicating how to balance this trade-off. Its value is positive, and we usually try values like 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, 10, and so on. As C goes to infinity, we recover the hard margin SVM, where violating the constraints is infinitely bad so that it never happens. Here's what that looks like in one dimension for a data set that is not linearly separable. There are no support vectors that we can choose to satisfy the hard margin SVM. If, however, these open points are chosen as the support vectors, then we get two violations of our constraints for which we need to pay a penalty PI but the result is that we can fit a linear classifier to this data. However, even if the points are linearly separable, we may still prefer a soft margin classifier over a hard margin classifier. In this case, for instance, we can separate the points with a linear decision boundary, but doing so would give us a very small margin. So if we allow a little slack and use these points as support vectors, we see that in return, the soft margin classifier gives us a much wider margin than the hard margin classifier could. If we set our hyperparameter C such that this outweighs the penalty that we have to pay, which comes in the form of these green bars, the soft margin classifier would choose this hyperplane and would put the decision boundary to the left of where the hard margin classifier would set it. With that, our next question is, how do we search for a good solution to the soft margin support vector machine objective? We haven't discussed constraint optimization much yet, so let's look at that in some detail. We have two options in this case. One is to express everything in terms of the parameters of the hyperplane, which allows us to get rid of the constraints. At that point, we have a simple unconstrained problem, and we can use gradient descent to find a good solution. And this in particular is good for use in combination with neural networks and deep learning, as we can use this as the top layer of a neural network, like we did before with the logistic regression and linear regression. The second option requires us to delve into constrained optimization, which we will do in the next video. The downside is that this doesn't allow us to use the support vector machine as the top layer of a neural network, but the benefit is that it opens the door to the kernel trick. We'll see what that means in the final two videos of the lecture, but in the rest of this video, we will work out option one. To get rid of the constraints, let's look at what we know about the value of pi. First, if the constraint for xi is violated, we can see that pi makes up the difference between what this function on the left of the inequality should have been, one, and what it is. So in that case, we can rewrite pi as one minus that function. If the constraint isn't violated, then pi becomes zero. And we know that this value that we computed above is negative. So by this reasoning, if we compute this value and it's negative, then we know that pi is zero 
And if we compute this value and it's positive, then we know that pi takes that value. In other words, we can rewrite the value as pi as the maximum of zero and this value that we've computed. If we take this definition of pi and fill it into our objective, we get this function. And since pi has disappeared, we can forget about the constraints on pi and treat this as an unconstrained minimization problem. If we find the w and b for which this function is minimal, that will give us the maximum margin hyperplane for our data. If we look at this function a little closer, we can see two quantities that are interesting. Firstly, we can think of this value on the right as the error. We know that the value yi times the output of our hyperplane should always evaluate to 1. So we simply measure the distance between 1 and that value. And that's how well our hyperplane does on this specific instance. The only thing we do by applying this maximum is to say that if this error drops below a certain value, in this case the value 0, then we don't care about those points anymore. We only care about the error of the points that are close to the hyperplane. And that's what we want to minimize. And then this second term, we can think of as a regularizer. It doesn't enforce anything about how well the hyperplane should fit the data, because it doesn't include the data. It just ensures that the parameters of the plane don't grow too big. And with that, we have discussed our final classification loss. Let's review the losses that we've seen. Here are all of our four functions. The arrow, known as 0, 1 loss, is simply the number or proportion of misclassified examples. And it's usually what we're interested in, but it doesn't give us a loss surface that is suitable for searching. Least squares we introduced as a loss function that isn't very good, but helps us to illustrate the principle. Then we saw a probabilistic loss, the log loss, also known as the cross entropy loss, which used a sigmoid function to turn the linear output into probabilities which we could then fit by using the maximum likelihood principle. This works well for non-separable data, but if the data are separable, it doesn't provide a unique solution. And as we saw in the previous video, this solution generalizes most naturally to multi-class classification through the use of a softmax function. And finally, in this video, we saw the soft margin support vector machine, which is also known as a hinge loss or a maximum margin loss. And this works well in high dimensional data that is mostly separable. In the next video, we'll look a little deeper into how we can solve constrained optimization problems, which we can then, in the last video in our lecture, apply to our soft margin SVM loss, opening the door to the kernel trick.